Welcome to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. The podcast that covers all things about humans, technology, technology. and particularly the bit in between. Welcome to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. The podcast that covers all things about humans, technology, and particularly the bit in between. With your host, Barry Kirby. Okay, and welcome to this episode of 1202 Human Factors Podcast. And this uh, this episode, we're going to be talking about uh, the rise of automation. And this is not like your um, Terminator, uh, but really it's more about looking at where um, where we're going with automation and actually what we should be looking for from a human factors perspective. Um, my guest this uh, for this episode is Dr. Malcolm Cook, and he has over 20 years of industry and academic experience, really focused on two main strands, um, that would be human factors and forensic psychology. He does have a wealth of experience in a really broad range of fields. And actually, I've known Malcolm for quite a long time because we first met, even though he pro probably won't remember, in 2001, 2002, when we both sat on the same committee with the Institute of Engineering Technology, which was around systems engineering stroke HF, because the, a the human factors professional network merged with the systems engineering professional network at that time. Um, I was lucky enough to be vice chair of it. And... We, we, we spent a fair bit of time then discussing the relevant relevant merits of the system systems engineering within, um, or rather human factors within the systems engineering domain. So Malcolm, welcome, and thank you very much for coming along today. Thank you, Barry. It's a um, pleasure. It's, um, we, we're doing this slightly differently because we, we're treating this as a working lunch, and so if you hear me eating halfway through it, that, that's, a, that's why. Um, so Malcolm, just to kick us off then, um, what is your current role? What is it you actually do now? Okay, I, I work for a large engineering company, and my current role is in assurance. Uh, that's assurance. Um, and the idea is, uh, basically, we'll mark other people's homework, and we determine if their work is suitably watertight and robust to justify the claims that they make. Um, as we know, within the, the safety world, there tends to be a claims argument evidence view. And essentially what we do is look through documentation and determine whether the safety justification is adequate to meet that claim. Cool. Uh, previously, um, I, I worked in a human factors department with the same engineering company. And my role there was largely focused on human reliability assessments, which is kind of an inversion of what it really is in, in some senses. Um, you basically look at major safety critical tasks uh, within a system design you determine how the person interacts with the system, how they think about the problem they're trying to solve, and you determine whether they can do it in sufficient time, because one of the ways you can fail is obviously to run out of time. Uh, and the other thing you would do is, is work out a notional probability. People argue a lot about the numbers, but you're trying to really just understand how people fail, how people make mistakes. I was talking to um, Grant Hudson from Cavendish Nuclear a, a couple of episodes back, and I put it to him that actually the ability for to roll a dice and put 10 to the minus 4 after it is not too far from what you do. He disagreed, and I suggest you probably would do. Um, you would too. I, I sort uh. of disagree in a way. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I take your point. I, the numbers thing I'm not really tied to. Um, I think what you're actually looking at is a structured uh, thought process whereby you, I mean, for example, you'll know, we start with the task analysis, which yeah. is the fundamental core aspect of human factors. You want to understand how does this person do the task. You might use uh, operational documentation or guidance for that. Uh, you, that helps you construct the task. You then try and understand what parameters are people working with. I mean, so you see, sometimes you see ludicrous things. People expect someone to remember seven items of information, uh, which if you're under stress and then you have to do calculations on those in, uh, bits of information on top, you're really asking far too much. And people then say, well, we want the person to do it right first time every time because it's a safety critical task. And I will go, well, they'll probably run out of time or they'll make a mistake. And that's <laughs> not really a surprise. So the numbers in that sense don't really matter. It's just saying, is it feasible to ask a person to do this task in this time with this information? Yeah, no, that, that, that's uh, really cool and really insightful. Um, you've also been around the, the HF domain for, for quite a while. What made you get into it in, in the first place, if, if I can take you back that far? Um, I was working again with a, a very large engineering company back in mm, probably 89, 93. Um, and I think one of the things I realized when I was working there, I was in a, a meeting. It, it was almost an apocryphal meeting. We were talking about the fact that uh, 
in modern technology, we have lots of information systems, advanced information systems for sharing uh, and building a picture of what's going on in the world. It, it can be in any environment. It could be in nuclear, it could be in military. Um, it could even be in, in healthcare where you're trying to work out what's happening to the patient on the table. Um, and what I realized was uh, people can see the same picture, the same information, but their understanding of it, their comprehension of it can be completely different. And if you're trying to coordinate activities between people, um, that's that's quite a tricky thing, particularly trying to do it in real time. Um, and I think that was that was my the starting point of me thinking, well, actually, people really matter here. Yep. So before you had that apocryphal moment, um, what was your, uh, I guess, how did you get into that first job? Because um, presumably you didn't go to university thinking, right, I'm going to be, well, you didn't because you've got to get into human factors. You clearly had a different path at that point. Uh, well, not really. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> I kind of slid into it. I, I started off, I, uh, I majored in psychology for my undergraduate degree. Um, I then uh, followed up with a PhD where I was looking at electrophysiological correlates of target spotting in human beings. I, I think you can see where this might be going. Of course you were. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, the lab I went into didn't have a working computer system, and it didn't have a working recording system and capture system. So I had to write right. all the programs. So I started being involved in programming and program development, which led me to my postdoc, which was, again, looking at target spotting rather predictably okay and uh, basically my job was to develop uh, real-time software for controlling advanced uh, display systems uh, and again the idea was uh, in that post we were looking at what's the minimal difference you can spot because if you're looking for very difficult targets they tend to hide themselves um, then you're basically looking well what's the minor change or minor difference in that target that makes it visible to people okay so Obviously, in, in the um, podcast description, description, I'll put a link to your LinkedIn so everybody gets a, um, a full view of your full and uh, rich career. But what has been, from that apocryphal moment, what's been your career path to, to get you where you are now? Um, well, I moved back out of industry uh, into academia uh, for a long period of time, about 20, 25 years. I ran a lab there and we did various contracts for, for different people looking at different kinds of problems. So I have looked at a wide range of problems. I've looked at command and control. I've continued looking at target spotting. <laughs> it seems to have followed me around so, all of my life. Some would say it's a fetish. Uh, it's, 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 well, it's, it's just, well, there's an appetite for target spotting, I think, in the modern world <laughs> yes, in various quite. ways. Uh, but command and control, um, virtual reality, uh, communication system, uh, you know, the, the list is endless. So it can either be an individual personal system, which I think actually I worked on a communication system at one point uh, which was for transmitting text between people in disparate places, which it looks like SMS texting <laughs> in some sense, but it was it was within another domain. And it was quite interesting looking at the problems they have with constructing documents really, really quickly, making them intelligible. So there's the construction process, which is almost like developing a narrative. And then you've got the job of actually transmitting it effectively to the people you want to receive it without transmitting the wrong information to other people that might be misleading. So small systems like that, individual systems to large-scale integration systems, so uh, control rooms and, and cockpits. So cockpits, I have, I have ha hung around a lot in uh, various <laughs> aviation uh, premises, <laughs> uh, looking at people in cockpits, both civil and, and military. And, and that, that's been interesting as well. I mean, I think big organizations sometimes come up against a problem. Uh, I had a, an organization that uh, had a bit of an incident in the cockpit because someone got into the cockpit. This was before shutting cockpit doors was really important. And it was interesting to try and understand their approach to, to looking at the problem. And I think that's one thing that human factors brings a lot. We have ways of analysing things in terms of methodology uh, and recording and also interpreting things that often gives people insight. And, and just today, that's exactly what I've been doing. I've been talking to people about uh, analysing a problem and then saying, well, this is what I interpret. And the interesting thing is that people who don't have a human factors background often get to a certain point in the uh, analysis and then stop when, in fact, yeah. the, the richer information is, is held deeper within. Yeah, I, I, I certainly get a lot of frustration where you see air, air incident reports and you'll, um, you'll get a big thing on the news saying and the, the result is it was down to human error. And that's what the report concluded, whereas my argument is, well, that's your starting point. Where are you going to do, do your investigation? Yeah, exactly. Um, what so, caused the human error? That's, exactly. That's the, the next thing. I mean, I think we've seen that recently with, if I can digress a little bit, with the, the Boeing 737 MAX issues. Um, 
we obviously had a system there that was was developed for a specific purpose. And I think that's that's an interesting case because um, with the Boeing 737 MAX, they moved the engines forward and up, which meant that the plane had a tendency to tilt nose up, which mm -hmm. would mean it would stall because yeah. there wasn't enough airflow. Uh, so you have a practical physical problem. Uh, so the solution of the designers was to, to build in an electronic system that corrected the nose up tendency by pushing it down, which sounds really nice mm -hmm. in some ways, unless you push it down too far. Uh, and the consequences are, are obvious for people to see. But the other thing was, uh, it was embedded within commercial pressures because obviously uh, Boeing were competing with Airbus. And this is not picking on Boeing because I think all companies have this problem. Yeah, We yeah. want to deliver a product at a price, uh, but we also have other issues like safety and various other things that have to be addressed in a reasonable way. And um, I think, unfortunately, they, they basically maybe underestimated the impact of this system, which is basically a nudging system that nudged the pilot back to uh, a safer state. Um, and uh, as a result, without training the pilot, so they weren't aware of the system being there and the fact they could switch it off, they then created a problem. And I think this represents something we see a lot within automated systems. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll talk to people designing automated systems and they'll say, well, why have we got a human factors person here? And you'll say, well... Because if the system falls over, who picks it up? Well, it's the person. Oh, right. Okay. So we've, yeah. we've, we've established that there's a person. There. What, what's he there for? And we, we used to have a joke. Uh, I must tell this, actually, because he said, <laughs> you said humor. And we always have a joke in the military aviation that you have a man, a dog, and a computer in the cockpit. The computer there is to fly the plane. The dog is there to bite the man if he tries to touch the instruments. <laughs> and the man is there to take the blame. So it's, it's not good. I think that, that situation... It's not that I'm against uh, automation. It's just I think we have to uh, consider all the impacts of automation. And some of it actually, even in autonomous systems, includes the human being, the operator. So they're talking about operating autonomous ships now from almost like air traffic control centers, but obviously yeah. sea traffic control centers. Uh, and you worry, perhaps, that maybe things will go awry. And, and it will be the person who has to then try and resolve those difficulties. If you are new to human factors and ergonomics, you might be wondering exactly what it is. In a nutshell, human factors is the study of how humans behave physically and psychologically in relation to particular environments, products, or services. As you will no doubt realize, that means human factors practitioners can add value to almost any project because they all involve people. The trick is getting that value as early in the project as you can because it ends up being much cheaper than fixing the issues later on. Yeah, and I think that leads us um, very nicely into what it is that we want to talk, talk, to, talk about today, and that is automation. Um, and really, I, I, I guess I wouldn't be too much, um, too, too far to say that you're slightly um, wary and cynical of just how much automation is, uh, how we engage with it today, and maybe how we rely on it too much without thinking through the consequences um, of, of the actions of that. But if we, I guess to kick off with, just so everybody's got, got the right idea, what, what do you think you mean by automation? What, 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 what are we looking at? Okay, um, I, I often get asked this question, and people quite often say to me, that's not what I imagined automation is. And I kind of borrow from the American uh, human factors descriptions. So people like Wiccans uh, and, and people of that ilk uh, have described automation as almost a four-stage process. You can have automation that collects information from the environment. So if, if you imagine, say we have a boat, uh, mm -hmm. a good example would be the Viking Sky, and it has uh, various sensors on the boat which feed information to a central processing system and then display it for people to see. And, and actually on modern ships, you have things like Ectis, which is an electronic uh, display system, which allows you to see charts, and which will also say to you, oh, I think you're going to hit that ship in front. And that's kind of useful. Those, so, so automation <laughs> yeah. can be useful. So, But in the case of basic automation, it would just collect the information. The next stage is interpretation, which is what I've just said there. So when the system detects you're going to collide with another ship, that's effectively an interpretation of that pattern of information. It's not telling you what to do. You can go a step further, and you can also have a bit of automation that effectively says, well, these are your options. So it, it offers you options, but doesn't actually do it for you, which sounds strange, but there are many reasons why that might be the case. 
Uh, and then finally, a, another layer of automation, if you like, on top is is where you uh, basically have, and you don't necessarily have automatic detection, but you can then press a button and the system will sort it out for you. So for example, oh, I'm in a pickle. I think I'm in a busy traffic area and I'm worried I'm going to hit people. Press the button. The automation works out a path for you, follows the path and gets you to the other side or into port or wherever you're trying to go without having an accident. So there are kind of four layers collection of information, interpretation of information, offering you solutions, and executing those solutions. Now, with perfect automation, uh, people are probably sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, you could just connect one end to the other. Now, that's where it becomes complicated yeah. because for a variety of reasons, uh, despite what people imagine, things don't always work out. So a classic example would be sensors fail. And when sensors fail, that means you no longer understand what's going on in the outside world. And there's a very good example of that. Uh, Air France, uh, Flight 747 going across the Atlantic. People got confused about which way was up and which way the plane was pointing. They manoeuvred the aircraft to the point where it stalled. As I've described before, you haven't got enough airflow over the wings to keep the plane in the air. And it, it effectively just becomes a break. So it falls. Uh, and everyone died in that crash because people became confused about what the system was telling them about what was going on. So you can understand, do we blame a person for not being able to interpret uh, a set of information which is in fact faulty or and, and diagnose that it's faulty? Because that's the important thing. Most mm -hmm. systems don't diagnose themselves. Or do we blame the automation? I, I think the argument, and it's been put forward by Neville Stanton and a, and a few other people, is that with a socio-technical system, it's the combination of the people and the technology together that make yep. the accident happen. So it's not it's not about blame, because that's the other thing. We have to get away from uh, apportioning blame. It's really about, well, how did this occur and how can we prevent it recurring in the future? Does that yeah, help no, you uh, understand how automation works? Yeah, At least no, in my no, mind, anyway. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's really good. I mean, I think it's quite obvious that in everyday life, people will be coming across different levels of automation just in just what they do every day from what they use on their phone because that's, you know, if you use social media inputs, then that brings together lots of different bits of data that you can then collate and understand the news and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, all the I, way think, I think we've also experienced, uh, on a personal level, uh, problems with automation. So when you get uh, spelling correction on your phone, <laughs> you can end up with some, I wouldn't would even try to say them here, <laughs> it's I was, polite company. <laughs> but yeah, you, you do get some interesting combinations of letters that appear on your phone as a result of autocorrection. Yes, Right, and I guess the fully automated system most people have probably you or have seen is autopilot on on aircraft, mm -hmm. and that's that's where most people see it coming in. But it is coming in a lot more with autonomous vehicles and uh, you know your, your cars that are coming over and things like that. So it is becoming more and more part of our, um, or it is going to become more and more part of our everyday life. But human factors will still be there. Be reassured. Uh, what, what someone said to me at a conference about autonomous vehicles. Uh, the most difficult thing about driving an autonomous vehicle is the people. <laughs> the people yes. out there on the street. Because yes. they don't behave like machines. Yeah. And it, it's the same for other cars as well. Because if you've got... It's almost that autonomous and non-autonomous elements within it. Because you can get autonomous elements to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And they'll sort themselves out. Brilliant. That's fine. It's the, it's the unexpected. And I think that goes back to what you said at the beginning is... How does aut automation deal with things that are unexpected because that's the things that humans are really good at yeah. is being able to process data and come up with a solution pretty quickly absolutely yeah so with that in mind then right now what do you think are the big dangers with automation what should we be looking out for i think one of the big dangers is actually in design okay because uh, i don't know if you've experienced it as a human factor professional but quite often people will say to me oh don't worry but this system will always work yes yeah and and we all know with the best will in the world, whether it's the sensors on the system, whether it's the communication routes. Uh, there was a good example of uh, a liner where someone kicked out the GPS cord. And as a result, <laughs> they had no uh, positioning on the boat, but they thought they did because they didn't notice that GPS had disappeared off the screen. Yeah. And they were driving the boat and they said, nah, you're those two lights over there. That's such and such. And that's such and such. We're in the right direction. They were completely wrong and they ran the boat aground. So, you know, things can go wrong with the communication systems that provide the information and sometimes also execution. We rely on a lot of hydraulic mechanical systems to do our bidding, uh, particularly in the maritime world, but also in aviation as well. Mm -hmm. We use hydraulics all the time. 
And if those physical systems fail for one reason or another, then you, you can find it very difficult to control the actual platform that you're driving. It's got to get the balance right as well, though, hasn't it? Because if, you, if you're designing a system and we, we go completely, right, this could fail tomorrow, this could fail today, this could fail this second, and everything is built around that, then you almost negate the point of having the autonomous system in the first place because, 90, well, hopefully 90% of the time, um, hopefully 99% of the time, it will work as... As, as functioned and in really what we try and design for is the one-offs the catastrophic failure that we don't expect to happen but do you, could we is it, are we at risk of perhaps throwing the baby out of the bathwater by being so pessimistic um where do you draw the line not really i think there's also it's not human factors it's more of economics yes uh, i i kind of seen it happen so if you have a system designed to do uh task x okay you, you think, all right, okay, it can fail in this way. All right, so we'll have to have an add-on that prevents task X going wrong in this condition. Oh, and then there's another case it can... And we keep adding to those cases where it can fail. And and we generally, in, in designing complex systems, talk about safety cases. And quite often what they do is they pick away at the system and say, well, it can fail in these different ways. Now, to ensure or assure that the integrity of the system is sufficiently robust means you have to buy really expensive parts. You have to verify and validate your software very carefully. And we know what happens if you don't. Uh, again, so off the top of my head, Ariane 5. Uh, in fact, it was cost that partly drove it. They, they took the inertial navigation system in a rocket. Uh, they transferred it from an old rocket, the Ariane 4, into Ariane 5. And they didn't factor in the fact that the translation, the horizontal translation speed in the new rocket was different. <laughs> and as a result, uh, when it got so far up, uh, it, it started to behave really badly. In fact, there was also a fundamental uh, programming error where they had a an integer overflow problem. That probably means nothing to you, but what basically happens is the number starts to oscillate between negative and positive. And basically that just waggles around the actual planes at the bottom of the rocket, which doesn't make it fly very well. Uh, but the interesting thing there was it was driven by cost because if we don't change the software from the old rocket to the new... Right? We don't have to re-verify and revalidate. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the biggest problem, I think, for automated systems now. Uh, it's not really human factors, people nibbling away at the edges. It's, it's their inherent problem that to verify and validate. If you think about it, what they're trying to do is make something as good as a human. And as you've yeah. already said, humans are infinitely flexible. To make software infinitely flexible and assure it makes it very expensive. So we have this trade-off now between... We have to think about, we can automate it, but should we automate it because of cost or other implications? Yeah. So where do you see the likes of a personal hero of mine, Elon Musk? You know, he's, he's clearly throwing a lot of money, firstly at SpaceX, company I'm drooling over, um, but also Tesla. So obviously Tesla has got their automated vehicles and he's, he's clearly been his own personal mission to make that happen. So he's throwing a lot of money at it. I think the company's only just become viable as a, as a profit-making entity in the or after five ten years of, of development um but he's obviously he's obviously driving that he's, he's hitting a lot of problems mm -hmm. and um but without driving forward with that then we won't get the solutions will we so no i i think it's inevitable it, it, if we look at the systems that really mattered well i say really matter but the ones that are really uh, significant in terms of being safety critical whether it's nuclear whether it's platforms like uh, aircraft or ships or whatever uh, or spacecraft even. Um, if we look at all these different products, um, the challenge is making them viable and affordable. Yep. That really is the trick. And the the problem we have is that we've changed, uh, in a sense, from being Victorian engineers where we over-design things and we could spend lots of money on putting extra metal on things to make it stronger and stiffer <laughs> yes. and, and last a little bit longer. Uh, now we're trying to make them lean. And in and, and trying to make them lean at the same time as trying to automate them, we're kind of conflicting uh, desires. We've got desires to minimize things. And we see that also in people. We, we obviously try and reduce the number of people it takes to operate a system. Yep. We put in automation. We make the argument, well, that's going to pick it up. And I think we go back to the, the kind of thing that you hinted at a little while ago is sunny day scenarios. Whenever you talk to engineers, they're forever designing for sunny day scenarios. You say, well, what happens if that falls over? Oh, that's a 10 to the minus four. That'll never happen. That's 10 to minus five. Oh, no, it'll never happen. So they give you a ridiculous number and say, well, it'll never happen. Uh, and then invariably it does. 
uh, and then we have an accident investigation. People say, well, why did this happen? And they look at the actual figures and they say, well, there's a problem here. Um, we've seen something similar, but in, in, a, in a worse sense with the Boeing 737 MAX one, because they were basically building a system which had inherent weaknesses in its sensor capability, which meant it was likely to fail. And they were saying, well, it's not really a safety critical system. They were arguing the system wasn't safety critical, although it was controlling the flight envelope. Um, that's very difficult to do. So yeah, I, I have to end on a positive note, though. <laughs> Elon Musk, uh, the, the one thing he is doing for problems is throwing a lot of money at it. Yeah. And if you ever want to actually... Well, it's, it doesn't always work out, don't get me wrong. Uh, throwing money at things doesn't always make things better. But being mean with money in terms of development costs is probably the worst thing you can do right at the beginning of a project. Mm -hmm. uh, because as we know in uh, systems engineering, the V-cycle... You want to shift everything to the left. And if you can do a lot of thinking, hard thinking and soul searching at the beginning, and that, that includes human factors, we have to we have to try and find our place at the table there because we are shaping design at the beginning, not at the end. At the end, we're, we're basically rubber stamping because uh, the inertia, the cost to change is very great. And therefore, that's not where you're going to make any any impact. It's got to be at the beginning. Yeah, no, I, I thoroughly agree with that. It's the the more that we can do up front and get it right. And it, I guess it's a it's always a program drive, whether it's a civil or a military or whatever, like I guess government based contracts as well. They as soon as as soon as you start, the first thing we're trying to do is then cut back on cost. Mm -hmm. And it's oh it is a very much a um um a false saving because on the cutbacks you make now chances are and there's loads and loads of examples of this you will then come back and end up spending more money at the back end to try and fix them now the argument is that that comes out of somebody else's budget so that that, that doesn't matter um but actually on a whole cost on a, on a whole cost approach and that's not uh, not brilliant i think though we we also see lots of lessons in there for human factors um if you design a product which is not usable and easy to use people go oh well we'll train people we can just keep training them training has a cost and there is an argument as well, which pe people will tell you, is that training is probably one of the weakest forms of defense. Very fragile. Because under certain circumstances, for example, under stress, fatigue, people make more mistakes. So if there's a, an opening, a latent problem with the system, it will be found by fatigue and error and stress. Um, so that's a, that's a human factors lesson. But there are other human factors lessons in there as well in terms of the way we approach Things. So, for example, uh, people who are paying money for projects tend to think, well, I can make differences in terms of the engineering by spending money. So I make a change. But what can I do with a human being? Mm. And what they don't seem to realize is you want to exploit the capabilities that we have as human beings to do some parts of the task. And we have to be very careful that in changing a task, and this is something that's not, it's not really from me, it's from Lausanne Bainbridge back in about 1983, the ironies of automation are that which it seeks to improve is what it destroys um, <laughs> yes. in the sense that the operator is less engaged in the task, is less what we would call situationally aware. And as a result, is more likely to make mistakes, finds it very difficult. If things change, if, if you get a big bang and you have to work out what's going on, the time it takes to rebuild situational awareness is much longer. And that might not be within the time frames of recovery. So you reach a certain point where it's, it's too late, it's game over. And I guess that then takes us almost full circle back to, you know, what is the point of automation? Because one of the things that I sort of put, um, push forward is the fact that we, we sort of try and look at automation, as you said earlier, take, right, we take the human out the loop, therefore it makes it inherently easier because it's, it's a system. But actually, automation just exists to fulfill human needs. You know, they're, they're tasks that have been set for either to deliver something to a human or to deliver some sort of result to a human. So it, it is just an extension of what it is that we want, and it's just delivering it by, um, by automated needs. Yeah, I, I think inherent in what you're saying, uh, and I don't mean to be critical, but, um, there, and it's again, it's not my argument. I borrowed this from someone else. All the best arguments are borrowed from other people. <laughs> uh, I mean, actually, that brings me to an important point, which I, you were going to ask me about uh, academia and, and being involved in industry. Just read, keep reading all your life and learning about new things. But coming back to that issue of, of who said this, well, Decker and uh, Sidney Decker and Eric Hollenagel have kind of very astutely observed there was a tendency for people to do what's called uh, substitution in terms of task allocation. And this goes right back to a, a paper by Fitz in 1951, I think it was. He was working on air traffic control. 
And what he did was very simple mindedly. He said, well, what, what are computers good at? Well, computers can process lots of numbers really fast, very accurately. You know, as long as they're programmed correctly, they will get it right. And actually, we, we've already seen that. Sometimes they don't always get it right. But for, for us, <laughs> because the software is written by humans. Oh, yes. there we are. Um, but um, in theory, you know, machines can do certain things very well. Human beings can do some things. They can come up with novel solutions, which is what you already said. Um, but to feed that novel solutioneering, they need data. They need to be fed and involved in the process. And one of the problems we've got, I think, with automation, which is actually not automation itself, it's the interface. It's how we yep. exchange information between the human and the machine. And, and one of the things, I, this is a, a bit of a interest of mine at the moment, shall we say, is uh, there's a lot of interest in America in what's called emotional computing. And the idea you can monitor people and the computer can go, you don't look very happy today, Malcolm. What's the matter with you? <laughs> and it does that on the basis of measuring various physiological states in the body. So we can do the same in, in terms of uh, control rooms. We could have the system looking at your pupils, seeing whether you're awake and alert, whether you've noticed that there's an alarm just gone off because it detects changes in your body, like your galvanic skin response or whatever. So we can use technology to work synergistic with people if we can get the computers, well, the automation side, to understand how the person's feeling and then interact with them through the interface. Um, and I think that's the thing we're missing because quite often we have this partitioning of systems into this is software, this is the interface, these are people that deal with that from computing, and these are human factors people. And well, we we put curtains on and put chins on and we put colours in. That's what they imagine. I don't know what they imagine we do, but something like that. But we don't. We look sometimes at the problem, and we actually even look beyond the interface. So, for example, the system you construct might involve two interposed problems, one which conflicts with the other if certain conditions apply. And so we're sitting scratching our head and thinking, well, how, how do we communicate that to the person? You know that this system is on, therefore that won't happen. Therefore, you have to intervene. You know, it's it's actually a lot more complicated. And I, I think we can we can do something and we can make a very big difference in terms of the exploitation of automation by getting that interface correct. And there is, a again, a very good paper a long time ago by Hoffman and various people from, if I could remember it at the moment, I don't. Uh, and it's about uh, how do we make uh, automation an intelligent team player? That's the key thing. We need to be team players. We, and in fact, that's the argument that comes out of socio-technical systems. We need people to work in synergy mm -hmm. with the systems they have. And the synergy applies to the automation as well. Yeah? Yeah. So given what we said and you know the, the rise of um, Musk and all that sort of stuff, is the development of automation inevitable? Because it seems to me at the moment that we can sit here as human factors people and say, right, we've got to have right interfaces of which brain human uh, brain computer interfaces is a particular fascination of mine at the moment mm -hmm. and how we do that sort of stuff but if we've got this level of automation we've got people who are demanding more and more for less um and therefore that is driving you down aut automated um automated routes is it inevitable that we have to solve the problems or do, should we be stopping automation should we be pulling back from it um i i, I think getting out of automation is really quite nonsensical uh, I think what we need to do is understand how we can employ automation and how we can make it more effective. Um, because I think you've already made the point, which is that the purpose of automation really is to do things for us mm -hmm. so that we can achieve certain goals and tasks. So it might be the production of power, it might be the production of chemicals and chemical process plants, whatever domain it's in. And the key thing is, it all revolves around people. No matter how much you try and exclude people from the whole system, it will always come back to people. Even when we have robots, we will still have robots serving a need for people, albeit that they are semi-autonomous or autonomous systems. They will have to interact with people because they're, they're well, they're hopefully doing things on our behalf which are not detrimental to our health. <laughs> uh, so we don't want... Uh, Robot lorry is running us over. We don't want. Uh, we don't want a big pack of robots jumping out of a lorry onto our car and saying we're having an accident. <laughs> yeah. No, that would be. Uh, I mean, I, I guess that that is the looking at the almost the sci-fi view of this, isn't it? Is a lot of people see automation and think, you know, are we going to get Skynet from like uh, Terminator, uh, the Matrix? That you know, all that sort of is. Is this the rise of the machines? Yeah, there is a paranoia there, and I think it goes right back even to my my youth. I remember watching two thousand and one uh, Space Odyssey. 
uh, where uh, HAL, the heurist heuristically programmed algorithmic computer, HAL 9000 series, actually. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm terrible a, with numbers. There's a level of geek there. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, yes. there's a certain level of geek there. But in the movie, um, the Dave, the, the pilot, goes outside the ship in a little a pod and he wants to get back in, but he's forgotten his helmet. So he, he says to Hal, open the bomb, open the bay doors. And Hal says, I'm sorry, I can't do that, Dave. And it, it's, it's almost now a joke because we always say, you know, computer says no. Mm. Um, that is, I suppose, the most frightening situation for people in relation to automation is where you want to do something and you're banging on the instruments and it's not doing. It's, it's, I, I've also had it uh, with actually voice automated systems. I, uh, I had the chief of BT once <laughs> who he said, oh, have a go with this automation system. And he handed me a mobile phone and I tried to talk to it. And obviously, it hadn't been trained on Scottish accent. <laughs> uh, and so as a result, I, I, I started shouting at it. You know, I said, left, left, do you like left? <laughs> you know, so, and that's actually, that's a natural human thing as well, because um, one of the other sophisticated things about very advanced pieces of automation and software, they have behavior. Uh, and in fact, there is an MIT program called... Uh, and well, but it's a book, The Media Equation, which talks about the fact that when we have very complicated systems, we treat them like people. They, we believe that they have difficult personalities or we think attributes that are human yeah. and we anthropomorphize them. And that's actually another lesson. We will anthropomorphize equipment and systems and automation. And what we have to try and do is engender a uh, system of automation, and that's the softer side of it that actually makes us feel good. And there is an aesthetics of it as well. Mm, yeah. So what do you think we um, should be doing better in terms of autonomy then? If we had a basically blank slate now to be able to change the way that we um, deal with autonomy, um, do you think there's any quick fixes out there that we should be looking at? Or do you think it's all longer term, we've still got a long way to go? Um, I think the difficult thing, this, this is probably me being pushed back into my academic background. Um, I think the difficult thing is we don't have enough information on autonomous systems yet. Okay. So I, I see people, and I, I, it will sound, it's wrong because I, he I can hear Barry already saying to me, <laughs> you're using emotional language, try and make it rational. Okay. So um, there's, the, there's a worry that we, we have to experiment with automation. Uh, in order to understand. So in, in engineering, it's one of these crazy things. Quite often we've moved towards modeling in all sorts of shapes and forms. Now, there's a big question of whether the model actually models what it models and does it model something different and therefore leads you down the wrong path. Um, but I think we have to do a variety of different types of modeling and simulation experimentation with automated systems to discover the properties, the emergent properties that we can't predict, that they will have, that we don't know, which are going to cause problems in terms of their actual use. Um, so I would put loads of money, if I was a company like Elon Musk, I would put loads of money behind research. I would put loads of money behind research in academia. I would get everyone on board as well, because I think this is the thing about, you know, we're generally talking about human factors. The thing about human factors, it's the, the oil that, that um, oils the grease and greases the wheels of, uh, of so many activities that we do in the world. So if you can understand human factors, you understand the way people interact with each other, interact with systems, the way they work together on systems. Um, it's really, you know, it's the vital part. Everyone takes being a human being for granted. And in fact, I just had this conversation this morning again. I said, but the problem is you don't understand what it is to be a human being, if you, even if you are. It's very difficult to see ourselves as others see us. And I think that's the skill you develop as a human factors person, is you look at the problem and you think, yeah, there's, there's more questions to ask. You don't stop by, well, that person failed. It's, that's not the end of the story. It's just the beginning. Yeah. I think that's absolutely brilliant. And Malcolm, I would like to thank you very much for your time with us today. Um, I think that's provided a really significant insight into um, basically the future challenges of, of automation. Where do you see automation being in five, ten years' time? What, what, what would be the most, I guess, mundane thing that you'd see being automated? Uh, I... Uh, well, you, I think you see it already. You see uh, lawnmowers uh, that go around people's gardens, chopping the grass and keeping it low. That's a really nice thing. I think if I was imagining, I would look to sci-fi for some of the important things. There was a wonderful, and I think it was called Frank. It, there was a, a sci-fi film about a man who is actually a career criminal. And he, uh, he's, he's aging 
and he gets given a robot to look after him, uh, which he interacts with. And it's really interesting because a relationship forms between him and the robot. And I, I think in a world which is challenged by uh, segregation and individuality, people need comfort and need the comfort of a relationship. And if we can provide that through a robot, well, why not? Does that do the job? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Um, just in looking towards the future then, there is a um, couple of conferences coming up and I believe you're going to speak at a, a, at a conference. Well, by the time this podcast comes out, it'll be probably today. Um, and so good, good luck with that. Thank you very much. Um, but on the 27th, 29th of April is obviously the Ergonomics and Human Factors Conference, which is going to be based in Stratford. Um, that's been in conjunction with ODAM which is the Organisational Design and Management Conference. I believe it's the first time that these two conferences come together. So that's basically going to get a double bang for your book if you go along to that one. And as an extra incitement, then I will probably be there as well. So if you want to come and have a beer, then... Oh, sorry, an intellectual discourse. <laughs> um, beer. Um, then it would be great to, uh, great to meet up with you. So... I can wholeheartedly endorse that. Dialogue is the best thing to take you forward. Absolutely. That and, and a good book. And, and I always find that the best, be, um, the best ideas in that come over a beer yeah. after you've finished whatever it is that you're doing. Um, so, again, thank you very much, Malcolm, for, for, for your time. And hopefully we'll catch you on the next one. As for now, toodaloo. Thank you for listening to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. Please do get in touch with your thoughts, questions, and comments. You can contact us at www.barrykirby.co.uk and on Twitter at B-A-Z underscore K. See you next time. And remember, it's more than just common sense. Listening to 1202, the Human the Factors, Factors Podcast. Podcast. Please do get in touch with your thoughts, questions, and comments. You can contact us on social media such as Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook at 1202 Podcast. See you next See time. You next and remember, it's more than just common sense.